Okay, perfect. Okay, so we're just gonna start with some quick intro questions. So mm -hmm. where did you grow up and where do you call home? So I grew up in a lot of different places because my dad was in the military. So um, I, I grew up until the point I was in sixth grade. I lived in Maryland, uh, Miami, Florida, Alabama, and I was actually born in Puerto Rico, but I like we only lived there for like three months, so I don't remember anything. And then we moved to North Carolina when I was going into sixth grade, and I've been here ever since. Okay. So this is what I would consider to be home now. Okay, nice. Very nice. And you said six years? Um, I've been here for, I think, almost nine years now. Okay, sixth nice. Grade, yeah, going into sixth grade was when we came up here. Okay, nice. Very nice. How do you like it? I mean, you've stayed. I, so. Uh, well, <laughs> I didn't have a choice for several years, but um, yeah. <laughs> I like it a lot. I mean, I chose to go to university in, in the area. Um, Raleigh is like 30 minutes outside Cary where I live now. Um, mm -hmm. I like it a lot. It's very hot in the summer, as are a lot of places in the South. So that's not too, too surprising. Um, sometimes it gets up to like 100, but we just kind of stay inside and it's fine. Um, and then in the winter, it's, it's pretty nice. It sometimes snows. And when it does, it, you know, shuts down the whole state. Cause we don't, we have like one snow plow for the entire state. Um, okay. so, um, that's, that's kind of fun, especially in uh, school when we would have like two weeks off because it snowed like an inch. So, um, but yeah, I like the weather here is pretty good. I like that it changes color in the fall. The tree, the trees mm -hmm. change colors, which is cool. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Okay. Nice. Very nice. Okay. That's good. Very good. So when were you diagnosed with diabetes? Um, I was diagnosed May 27th, 2020. Okay, so very recently. Yeah, pretty recently. It feels like a long time ago because of the whole COVID like time yeah. lag thing that happened. But then I look back, I'm like, it's been three years. It's not that long. Yeah, it has been three. I guess it has. I wasn't even thinking. I was like, okay, so it's been like a year. That's not. Yeah, it's the know? COVID lag. <laughs> it's very, very weird. Yeah, it's a lot to like, definitely a lot to understand about your own body and also a lot during the pandemic that I can't imagine how you even like make those doctor's appointments or get the care that you need it was weird yeah so I I had actually started feeling sick like had started having problems back in like September of 2019 like I just started to uh, drink more water and just I noticed like going upstairs became like the worst thing in the world for me yeah. um and I was still able like I was doing dance at my high school so that was like all okay. I've just noticed I get like really, really winded easily. I had been doing dance like for several years, but I was like, eh, you know, I'm dancing less, maybe I'm weaker, whatever. Move kind of just kept on going on with my life. I lost a lot of my hair. Um, like oh, wow. I, I've had a lot, a lot of hair to start. So it wasn't like it looked like I was balding or anything, but like if you knew me, you'd be like, oh wow, your hair is like a lot thinner. Um, and wow. so that happened for a while. And then I had a wellness appointment in February. And my doctor was like, wow, you dropped like a whole BMI and weight. And I was like, yeah, okay. And, um, and I was like, yeah, I'm losing hair. And she's like, well, if you start having more problems, come back and we'll do blood work. Cause at that point I didn't even tell her about the drinking water and going to the bathroom more. Cause I was like, yeah, you know, I'm drinking more water. Hey, you still drink realize water. it's like, you yeah. never put things together. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and like, so like COVID happened and I was still having the problems and then uh, something else happened. I was like, okay, this is, we're, we're done. We need to go to the doctor and get the blood test done. I didn't want to get a blood test done because the needles are scary. Um, so I go in and they just do, they thought it was a thyroid problem, which yeah, it kind of was, uh, but not really. So they, they took the blood. That was fine. And then my doctor called us like a few days later and she's like, uh, yeah, was, were you fasted? I'm like, uh, yeah, I didn't eat anything. And I was literally dying in the office, but, uh, and she's like, yeah, you're, the company logged it as not fasted because it was so high, my blood sugar level. So then she's like, well, let's come back in and make sure that that's because I don't, I think it was like 200 or something. I don't think it was like crazy, crazy high. Mm -hmm. um, and so I came back like the next day and I wasn't fasted because I was like, mm -mm, we're not doing that anymore. And it was just a blood sugar test and a urinalysis. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the urinalysis came back with glucose and uh, ketones in my urine, which is like, you know, diabetes. Yeah. And um, my, blood just they just a little, little uh, finger prick test and it came back as like 520 and the nurse that was in there was like oh my god and my mom and I were like oh is that bad and she's like yeah that's like really really high and we were like oh okay we we don't know anything about this and so the doctor came in and it was during COVID. So we all have our masks on. We're like, you know, trying to keep our distance from the doctor. She's like, I'm going to take my mask off to, because this is like really big news. And I was like, 
What's she okay. gonna tell me? <laughs> so she like pulls her mask down and she's like, oh yeah, I think you have diabetes. And I was like, okay. Like I wasn't, I knew something was wrong with me, but I was like, sure, diabetes, why not? And then she's like, you need to go to the hospital. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> that was the part that got me like really upset. And I was like, I can't go to the hospital. I, I don't go to hospitals. Like that's, that's not for me. And she's like, well, you don't have a choice here. So um, my, I was still a pediatric patient at the time because I was 17. So uh, my mom and I got to take a three, three ish day trip. I think it was like two nights at the hospital, uh, which was interesting because I had never been in a hospital before the ER was super empty. We literally just walked in and, and like, I was able to go home and get like a bag of stuff. because It wasn't like they had to call an ambulance or anything. Um, and then they like brought me to the ER and they were, they had me in there just while they were running their tests and stuff and I couldn't eat. So I'm like starving because apparently, you know, I was diabetic and my thyroid was also all messed up at the time. And so they were like, you can't eat until we get you on the floor because they need to do your insulin and all that stuff. And they wanted to make sure I was an NDK, which I wasn't. So I also had a fever when I went in because I was so stressed out. It was like super, super low grade fever, but you know, COVID panic at the time. So they're like, we need to test you. And I was like, oh, okay, sure. So they tested me and it was negative. Um, so we went up to the floor at like, I think like nine o'clock. And my mom was like, you know, she hasn't eaten since like 1.30 today. And they're like, oh yeah, we should probably get you some food. So I was able to do that. And then I remember the nurse, she, she was probably a newer nurse. She was fine at her job, but she wanted to double check all the insulin doses, which is, a, I respect her for doing that. Um, so she's like, I'm just going to go double check with someone else to make sure that this is okay. Just um, like carb ratios and the, the Lantus dose. So then she did them that night. Cause I wasn't about to give myself a shot after all that stuff. So she did the injections and then they woke me up, you know, several times during the night, check my, my, um, mm -hmm. uh, blood sugar, I guess. And also like, um, vitals. So blood pressure and all that stuff. But I think that part was pretty normal. It was just everyone being in masks and stuff was just really weird. It's like eerie. And it was really quiet too. Normally, like, I don't think hospitals are that quiet. Um, no. but now there are, there are several, it was the pediatric wing of, of things. So there wasn't like, there were no COVID cases on the floor because they had COVID people in a different area, but like, I, there was really no one there. So there was like a few other rooms that had people in them, but we were in our own room. I had my own bathroom and it was just weird. <laughs> and so how old were you at that point? You were 17? I was 17. Yeah. I, I had just, I had just turned 17, like a month and a half earlier. Okay. Gotcha. So how has it been being diagnosed like as almost an adult? Cause you're obviously going into it with like a whole life of not being diabetic. Yeah. Like that's, that's like the whole debate that I've had with so many people, um, who have mostly is actually with people who have kids with diabetes that they'll tell me like, Oh, it's better to be diagnosed when you're younger. And I'm like, I don't know that it really makes a huge difference for me. Yeah. I did almost all my care on my own. Like I was 17, my parents, yeah, they'd help me out. Like if I had to do insulin injections in my arm, I usually have them do it just cause I hadn't figured out how to like take my, uh, put my arm on like the back of a chair to get the fat to pinch up. And also I had like no fat on my body at that point either. Cause I was so thin. Um, so like they would do that, but for the most part, like when I put my Dexcom on for the first time, they were there, but I was the one doing everything. Yeah. Um, because I mean that, that age kind of have to, um, and even leaving the hospital, even though my parents were with me, it, they switched off at one point just so they could both kind of get the education. I knew more about it than they did when we left the hospital, just because it was like, I'm the one who had to prick my finger. They did have to give me an injection before I left the hospital. Um, we both had to do it and they wouldn't have let us left if we hadn't done that. But um, yes. it, it was like, it was the expectation was that I was the one doing all my care. Um, and then they got the training too. So if I had any questions, it was usually we'd have to call the um, doctor's office because we're like, we both don't know. We're like, mm, let's, we can't really Google it because we don't trust Google. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we yeah, had so to many. call in, I think, once to the, it's not even an emergency, that's just the nurse line, the overnight nurse line. And it was for like something like really like now looking back at it, I'm like, why did we call about that? Like if I did that now, I'd be like, eh, whatever. Um, so I don't, I think it was like, I accidentally gave too much insulin, mm. but then we were like, just eat more food. And I was like, that's smart. So like, now I'd be like, eh, just eat more food. Um, but at the time I was like, we're going to die. The ambulance yeah. is going to have to come. And then it was fine. So 
it's all just like a crazy learning curve because even like as much information as they could try to tell you in the hospital when you're first diagnosed like you're not going to retain a lot of it and you're sick yeah and like they don't have time to explain literally everything and everyone's body is so different like it's just really hard it's for me I think I got really lucky because I just always handled insulin I guess, well, some people just have like crazy, when they're first diagnosed, they have like that, like just sudden drop and where all of a sudden they get insulin and then they have low blood sugar all the time. I didn't really have that problem. I had to sometimes cut back, sometimes go up. It it was a little bit weird in the first like year and a half ish. Um, And now it's, I, the way I eat and stuff also helps too, because I eat very, very low carb. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't give myself a lot of insulin, but I'm also not eating a lot of carbs. So I don't get like huge spikes, but when I do, they always come down really fast. And that's when I crash and I'm like, oh, this is why I don't do this kind of thing. So yeah. uh, it's humbling. Um, so, but at the, at that time, I think there was at one point, my basal insulin rate was too high. And I, I was like, I don't know why. I'm going low, like just constantly going low, constantly going, treat it low. And then I'm low again, treat it low and I'm low again. And they're like, yeah, you're, you're basal insulin. You're, you're, you need to cut back on that a bit. And I was like, oh, that's smart. Yeah, that makes sense. And then I was fine. So it's just of it. like, it's the math, it's the like nutrition. Yeah. It's they're like, oh, count carbs. And I'm like, who? Like, exactly. Cause it's like, right. But then at the same time, obviously everyone's seen like the pizza spike is ridiculous. And yeah, then you like crash because all of a sudden it's like gone and like the yeah. fat makes it hold on for a different amount of time. So it's definitely, yeah, definitely yeah. a lot. To manage. So what would no. you say? Oh yeah. What were you oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, what would you say your favorite and least favorite parts of having diabetes are? I know that's kind of a hard question. The favorite gets kind yeah. of hard. But the, I guess the, there's the, lots of teachable moments. So yeah, I think that the, my least favorite is probably, uh, the inconsistency and the anxiety that comes with it, especially around trying to do new things. Cause I'm like, like, and I think also with that is like explaining to people that like, I don't have control over this. So when like, if I'm being a problem and I'm trying to like, be like, this is bad. Like I need to fix this. Also not wanting to cause a panic because some people will be like, oh my gosh, your blood sugar's high. We need to call an ambulance. I'm like, no, I just yes. need to like sit down, drink some water, maybe walk around a bit. Um, if it's low, then I just need to eat something. It's not like a huge emergency, but I think the inconsistency, cause it, it does definitely, especially with like in a situation where I'm already starting to lose control, like traveling, I, I haven't, if the fl- plane gets delayed, uh, like, what do I do kind of thing to yeah. like normal anxieties and then compounded on top of that is like, no, I have to manage this disease. And I, if I don't manage it, things can go bad pretty fast. Um, yeah. which is the other thing that people don't realize if you have other conditions and you forget your medication one day, you'll probably be okay. You might not feel great, but you're not, you're not going to die. If I forget my insulin or like, let's say I'm in injections and I just don't do them for a day, I could be in the hospital. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's always a hard part to explain to, to people about type one and type two, because I think that that's almost a better way to differentiate where it's like, they're both really hard and they're both medical conditions that are chronic, but like there's the immediacy aspect of type one that I don't think type two has yeah like, like type two dk is like not really a concern for type and two diabetics you low, for... but like your lows aren't as low like you're never hitting like the 40 30 you're gonna keep going down you feel yourself losing all of your energy like <laughs> the 40s they... i like sit there and i'm like what you're like there's no way yeah <laughs> so would you say that it gives you more perspective on life um i think so i think it also um uh, shows me, cause I was never like, I never identified myself as having a disability, um, growing up. Cause I, I didn't. Um, and then all of a sudden it was like, yeah, this is what it's like. And it's, it's like eye opening. It's not like bad. I don't think disability is bad and it's a bad word or anything. It's just like, this is what it's like to have to manage something that the rest of the world doesn't understand. And that even if you explain to them, they still just might not get it because they just don't have the education aspect that I have. I mean, the three years of diabetes, like knowledge whereas yeah. them like, trying to shove it into three minutes so that they understand that yeah the insulin can't really go through the x-ray machine neither can the sensors and yes. then it's for a medical condition and then they usually understand but it's like stuff like that like little little things that I have to explain or like having to 
if I'm at a restaurant, be like, yeah, I'm going to ask you for some weird stuff because I can't really eat pasta. So I'd rather have uh, vegetables instead. So it's stuff like that. Um, and not always do you need an explanation. Like I'm not going to go there and immediately walk up and be like, I have diabetes. And no, but I'll just be like, yeah, I'm going to ask for some weird stuff. It's, it's fine. <laughs> Yeah. And I definitely think it teaches the people around us. I feel like it te- it's definitely taught me a lot because I was diagnosed when I was 10. I think mm-hmm. how to like make friends in a different way where like at first as a kid, I found it really hard to be like, not everyone is meant to be my friend. But now as I've gotten older, I'm like, if some people just don't get it and they don't have the energy or time to get it, like, it's just not going to work. Like, yeah, I just, yeah, I, I, need, their problem. I need the safety net. Like it. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of cool to know that at the very least, like we're imparting knowledge on our friends. It's making them more empathetic and like understanding yeah. everyone. But it's also just like it's a weird thing to take on as an individual like burden to like think about, like yeah. as a kid and growing up. Like yeah, because that's the thing is, well, I was diagnosed during COVID, so I wasn't even at school. I was in my junior year of high school, but I didn't go back to school in person until my freshman year of high school, which was also like a really weird time because I had never done diabetes management outside of my house because yes. of COVID so but yeah. but yeah I think and also going to school I realized I was like people don't understand this like my family kind of gets it some of some of my siblings um they understand the basics of it but don't really understand like why if we go to a restaurant we can't go to a pizza place all the time because if they don't have food that I can eat then I I can't eat kind of thing Um, and it's also frustrating for them too, because they should be able to eat the stuff they can eat and they do. It's just that, um, sometimes it takes a little bit longer to find restaurants just to make sure that I can eat food, which is something we never dealt with before growing up. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And then it's hard to not feel like it's something that you've done or that Mm -hmm. it's like making it harder for other people because of you. Cause it really has nothing to do with you. Like you Yeah, it's like, Oh, believe me, if I could get rid of it, I would, but yeah. I can't, so I'd love to eat an entire pizza and not feel super sick for two days later but like the thing is like that's it so if like oh your blood sugar goes high I'm like no 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 I will be like out of it for like the next day yeah exactly exactly like it's not that simple and it's weird too getting older and having it for longer because you just kind of get used to it in a different way and kind of find different yeah. ways to manage it but it is very odd to just kind of now in my routine sometimes I'll be like you know like in the 300s for like an hour and I'm just like well time to go for a walk like that's just not gonna work so I'll just like get up and go on a walk and it's just a weird like I guess that's just a thing that yeah I know at first if I, my blood well for a while my after diagnosis my blood sugar is still like in the 200s but now if I go up to 300 I'm like I'm like oh my god what's what's happening like who who is this person like controlling my Dexcom and it's like oh you wait sometimes my Dexcom's not working and then that's different yeah. but um a lot of times it's just like yeah I ate something I shouldn't have and that that's what happens the carb count isn't quite um, right like it's hard yeah it's definitely hard the carb count also going out to eat is so hard yeah that's the other thing is like we eat a lot of uh local restaurants they don't have nutrition facts so like that's and they like to add weird stuff because if I make rice I'm just gonna put water and rice into a pot and that's it so the only thing I need to count is rice but then for some reason even if it looks like it's plain rice, you eat it and you count like a cup of rice is this much carbs. So you do that. And then for whatever reason, it still spikes your blood sugar up like crazy, even more than it would if you were just at home eating rice, which is what I never really understood. Cause I'm like, rice should be rice. But when I eat it out, it's like extra, it's extra special rice. That's like magical and can just shoot me through the roof in like two minutes. So yes. I definitely feel that rice is also just hard rice has always been a hard one for me like it really will like you at different times there are times when I will eat rice just plain rice I will drop low and then like 10 minutes later not like low I'll just start seeing my blood sugar dip and sometimes it will actually go low and then I'll like treat a low I usually use like 10 carbs to treat a low and uh it'll just like the, the carbs combined with the rice which I don't even eat a lot of rice it's like maybe 18 grams of carbs just like through the roof. And I'm like, I, I don't even know what to do at this point. And it's not like I'm, it's not like I'm waiting 30 minutes to eat and then I'm having low blood sugar from not having eaten. It's just, it's like such a weird absorption. Rice thing. is weird. And it definitely like, I think sometimes if you have rice with other stuff like protein, it can be a little easier, but it's mm-hmm. like the balance of how much it is that you need to even have is so hard. Mm-hmm. It's definitely- okay. Mm-hmm. in a completely different tangent. I want to know more about what you're doing with veterinary science. So what is your major and what are you, what does it look like tangibly on the ground? 
So um, I'm a animal science major and I'm in the concentration of uh, veterinary bioscience at NC State. And then I'm also doing the zoology minor. And then on top of that, I'm considered a pre-vet, which is like the same as like if you're pre-health or pre-law, it's just like a classification. It's not really a major. It's more of like a track. So um, I want my goal is to go to vet school. So I just need to make sure I'm getting my prerequisites and then also getting my experience. So for me, uh, I take animal science courses, um, a lot of um, like chemistry, biology. Um, next semester, I'm taking physics, uh, an animal management class, which is for my major um and then a zoology elective and some other classes that I don't remember right now that are all for my major they're not um, gen ed requirements um and then on top of that I work at a vet clinic usually just on weekends during the school year just because of hours and time and stuff and I'm a vet assistant there and then I do research out at the vet school near me so out at NC State's vet school I assist with their neuroaging uh program uh which is looking at aging dogs. So I do like a lot of handling for cognitive testing and gait analysis and stuff. Um, so that's really cool and really fun to learn about like the research aspect of veterinary medicine. And then one day a week, I travel with a large animal veterinarian and mm -hmm. that's giving me large animal experience like goats, sheep, horses, uh, pigs, and then like alpacas, llamas. And we treated a camel the other day, which was a terrifying experience. Hey, good one. How did that go? What was wrong with the camel? The camel was fine. It was just a health and wellness exam. It actually went really well, better than I thought it would. Uh, but when we went to do the vaccines, it was not a happy camel and just screamed. It, that's literally all it did. It was just like, stop, stop. And then we were done. I was like, oh, can I eat now? And we're like, sure. And it was fine. Uh, but okay. we have like alpacas are usually the worst because alpacas and llamas are just, um, they're either fine because their people yeah. handle them. Or they're mm. kicking at us and spitting at us and it's disgusting. Yeah, it's spit, right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They spit room and fluid. So it's like, it's basically like vomit and it's, oh. it's disgusting. Yeah. It's oh, not just sure. like saliva. It's like they're oh, project projectile vomiting. So. Oh, that's awful. Okay. I yeah. didn't realize what it was. Gross. Well, so you have to like stay away from the back end because they'll kick you and then stay away from the front end because they'll spit on you. So you kind of have to like stand at the side and be like, please don't hurt me. So. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So how did you get into veterinary science? Um, so it was like, uh, like a lot of people will tell you like, oh, ever since I was little, I wanted to be a veterinarian. So yeah, that was definitely true for me. I kind of flip flopped back and forth, uh, in middle school and then a little bit in high school, I wanted to be a guide dog trainer in high school, uh, just cause that was cool. But then I really like medicine and I really like science. So I wanted to be able to do that. I don't, love human medicine. I think it's interesting, but I'd rather treat animals because I do love animals. Um, so that's kind of uh, why I chose that. And it's definitely a path you have to choose because you cannot be forced into it. It is a, it is a lot of work just to get into um, vet school. It's very competitive, more competitive than med school just because of numbers and statistics. Yeah. So um, it's challenging, but the people who do it, they they really enjoy it. You You have to. <laughs> Yeah, that definitely makes sense. And then what about like diabetes and being a vet? Does it impact? Do you find that like you're ever out like on a job and you get low and that's a challenge or like, yeah, what yeah, that happens like, occasionally. Uh, I don't have a whole lot of low blood sugars. Um, just that's kind of been consistent since the, I've been diagnosed. I have had my fair of like in the forties on the couch, like hanging on to life moments, but, um, uh, for the most part, I don't have a huge problem with low blood sugar, but when I do, it's always right in the middle of something. Uh, one time we were uh, out euthanizing a, a cow and I got out of the truck and I immediately, I was like grabbing stuff to like stethoscope, whatever. Um, and I was like standing, I'm like, my blood sugar's low. So I checked it and it was like, it was low, but like barely on the, the cusp of being low. So I was like, okay, I can treat this and keep working kind of thing. Um, so it was like a weird thing because the cow decided to put herself, she was down, but she was kind of in like a, a little bit of like a pond, uh, like kind of muddy area. So that was, uh, I felt bad because I was like opening a thing of fruit snacks and like eating it on the way down with the client next to me. And I'm like, I am so sorry, my blood sugar. I didn't say anything, but I was like, my blood sugar's low and I'm just shoving them in my mouth as quickly as I can because I felt bad. I didn't want to like look like I was like pulling out my popcorn about to like, no, I was like, I'm so sorry. This is a medical, will become a medical emergency if I don't treat it. Um, so yeah. that was awkward. Uh, they didn't, I don't even think they noticed, but I noticed and I was like mortified. Yes. 
Um, and then another time I was in at the clinic, I was in a room with a, with a, uh, the vet and a patient and a client. And my Dexcom was like screaming on my phone and my pump. And I don't even, I think I was like barely low or I had already treated the low. And then my Dexcom caught up with the fact that it was low mm. and, um, it was just, it was very loud. And I'm like, I am, I am so sorry. It, it has a mind of its own trying to like turn it off. Um, and then it goes off again because it's like, oh, it's been 10 minutes and you're still low. I'm like, yeah, thank you. I, I can see that kind of thing. So that's a little bit annoying, but uh, that's always the most annoying beep too. Like I had mine, like, well, I have, I had to redo the app, but I had, before I had it, I had to change the low alert because I wouldn't wake up to it at night. But I didn't oh. like, change it during the day and at night and like flip flop back and forth. So it's just a like chronically obnoxious. And it's like, like well, kind of just like beep, beep for like, I think it goes off for like 30 seconds unless you shut it off earlier. Gotcha. Uh, without, like in the room, I'm like, be quiet kind of thing. So yeah. yeah. And it's the, the pump is, I think, scares people, especially in hospital setting, because mm-hmm. we'll be doing like surgery on a patient and I'll just be standing there or like dental procedures. So anesthesia machines on monitors are hooked up and you'll just hear like a really medical sounding beep. And they're like, Oh my God, what is it? I'm like, it's me. It's my pump. It's telling me my insulin is low in my cartridge. It's okay. Yeah. And it's just, it's, it's weird. Cause you're like, what is that sound? Is that the machine going off? What it's a weird sound. So yeah. And it's just so intense too. Yeah. It's and really like- good. Clearly medical sound. Like, I feel like in classes, that can be the hardest thing. Mm-hmm. So yeah. that actually, that feeds pretty well into my next kind of question. So I'm wondering, like, first of all, how have you found your ability to access disability services or like student accessibility services as a person newly diagnosed with a chronic illness? And then also how and kind of like what is your relationship with veterinary medicine and um, accessibility services? Because I know that you like spoke a little bit about that. Um, yeah, so at school, so when I was diagnosed, I mean, my senior year was online, I technically had like a 504 plan that we set up like literally the last semester of my senior year, just because it wasn't super important. Um, and then going into college, you can't transfer a 504 plan, you have to like go through the process all over again. So, I mean, all I did was really had to um, submit like a document basically saying that I was diabetic. I actually had to do, I did dual enrollment classes my uh, senior year at a community college. So I had to do the process with them. So I kind of already knew what to do. It's just sending in the medical record or like a note from your doctor. Diabetes is so common that people aren't going to be like, whoa, you need sugar and food. Um, So like the the DRO disability resource office at NC state is really good. I've never had a problem with them. Um, I think I had one meeting with my, like a counselor type person where they basically just explain, this is going to be your accommodations. Uh, Cause it's not in, I think in high school, they gave me like extended time, but at college, they give me stop the clock breaks, which makes more sense mm-hmm. for what I have. Cause I don't need extended time. I just need to be able to pause an exam if my blood sugar goes low. And then they also talk to me, like if anything ever happens and you're like crazy, crazy high and you can't take an exam or you just feel like really bad, like talk to them and they might be able to reschedule you later kind of thing. So like they work with me. Um, Luckily, I haven't had that happen yet. They said that sometimes they have time when people go uh, so low that they can't finish the exam and then they're able to address that, which is nice to know that if that ever happened, I'd have that option. Um, In terms of, I have a lot of lab classes. That's like the only time where I really have to like go up to professors and be like I'm gonna have food with me I can't eat it in the lab room because that's like technically like a biohazard I can't Mm -hmm. you know be doing a chemistry experiment and be like hold on I'm low so they're like that's fine just go sit in the hallway and do it um and they're like you don't need to ask just go like they don't care in college um and then I do have some off-campus field labs so it's really the same thing they're all animal science things so I think like technically they said that i probably should walk away but when you're treating low it's not like you're pulling out like a checkered blanket and like you know it's just like carbs fast it it's not yeah. um, it's not like a full meal which uh my actually my professor um my my first animal science professor his son has diabetes so he was like I get it you're good oh perfect so that was nice to to have especially in my first semester and I was like I don't really know what to say but they they're good about giving you like kind of like a script of what to tell your professors Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I think it's pretty 
routine. I see a ton of other students with diabetes in my classes with like Dexcoms or insulin pumps. And I'm like, yep, I, I, I see you kind of thing. So I know that I'm not the only one emailing my professors being like, uh, I don't, you don't even need to say that you're diabetic, just being like, I have a medical condition. Sometimes professors will tell me like, you can't eat in the lecture halls. And I always just ignore them when they say that because they probably won't even notice me eating. And if they do, I'm just going to be like, I'm trading a low blood sugar. Mm -hmm. uh, so, which they, like, the thing is, it's like, they understand that they have a student with diabetes in the room, but they might not know your face. So that's yeah. the only time I would have a problem. And then they, I'd go up and talk to them and be like, I'm so sorry. But yeah, I, I am, I am that diabetic student that emailed you like potentially two months ago, you might not even remember kind of thing. So it's not, it's like, don't take things personally kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so. But definitely important for, to like advocate for yourself and have people know that yeah. it is you. There's you some, um, I tested the DRO pretty much exclusively just because um, professors can't really provide stop the clock breaks because um, if there's a, a lecture um, happening after them, they can't really use the space and they know yeah. that moving a student to their office that's potentially on the other side of campus is pretty disruptive. So they're like, just test there, which is, I like testing there. I have a desk when I test there, so I don't have to worry about writing on the little tiny the little one, um, yeah. things in the lecture hall. Um, and it's usually pretty quiet. And I know that the people there are willing to help me if I have any sort of issues. Whereas if I'm in a lecture hall, it's just weird. Cause then I'd have to like walk up in front of the class and be like, oh, my blood sugar's low kind of thing. Um, so it, I like, I would prefer to test at the DRO. Um, even if a That's professor cool. is like, oh, I can do that. I'm like, mm, you, you think you can, but you probably can't kind of thing. So yeah. That makes sense. So what about veter um like I, I'm thinking more now like accessibility mm -hmm. and then like service animals. So what is that yeah. like and how did you get interested in that? And like, yeah, what does that look like? So um I got I started raising guide dogs in my, I think it was my sophomore year of high school. So around like second semester in my freshman year of high school. Um, I found out about puppy raising for guiding eyes for the blind. So I was like, oh, that's something that's really cool. I want to um, potentially do that. And at first I was like, my parents are not going to let me bring a puppy into the house. We have dogs or we had, we had one dog at the time, but it, it's a lot to have a puppy in the house. But I talked to them. I'm like, no, that actually sounds really cool. And I was like, oh, that's not what I was expecting. So um, we did the whole training process. It took us about six months. You have to go through like an eight week training course where they basically tell you what to do and what not to do with your, with your dog. And then you get, you have to um, sit for two um, current uh, puppies that are being raised in the region. So we did that. Um, and then you have to kind of wait for a puppy to be available. And usually they like to do it in groups. So uh, Marianne, the dog that I raised first, she came down with two other puppies that were not litter mates. They were just um, other puppies that came down for other raisers in the region. And then we all, uh, they like to do it in batches. That way we can all do like our little puppy training classes together. And it's not like one person on their own. And it's also nice to have someone else to be like, oh my gosh, this dog is peeing in the house constantly and kind of like commiserate with each other. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's nice to be able to have it like that. But that's, that's kind of how I got involved because, um, yeah, it was a puppy, but I also knew that the goal was to have it become a guide dog. And I, um, if you know, Is that it going like, into, like, guide dog or what kind of guide dog? Um, so guide dog for people who have a uh, visual impairment. So okay. like some people seeing eye as some people call them seeing eye dogs, but that's like a copyrighted oh. term for a specific company. So oh. like, okay. yeah. So, um, guide dogs is like the broad sense term okay. so uh guiding eyes for the blind is one of many different uh puppy training programs that do it seeing eyes one there's also guide dogs for the blind out in california they're the ones who did uh pick of the litter on disney plus that's that's their program and uh their dogs that are in that um show uh and then guiding eyes for the blind is like the same thing but in new york and uh we do labs and german shepherds and they're all they if they pass through the program and they graduate with a visually impaired handler they're almost exclusively guide dogs and then some of them also do like mobility assistance or um potentially like i, I don't know how it really worked with hearing if you had a deafblind uh person but that's also uh potentially they do some like special training programs uh with some of their dogs if they have clients that have that and it's all it's a non-for-profit so the the handlers don't pay for their dogs um it's all it's all uh free Okay. 
So uh, okay. the puppy raising is like the first step. So when Marianne left my house, she was like not at all prepared to be a guide dog. She was well trained. She knew all her commands. She was well socialized, but she could like, if you put a harness on her, she would just sit there and be like, okay, yeah, this is great. She wouldn't know to like how to lead a person. If you tell her to go left, she'd be like, what? So she had to still learn all of those cues and that's all professional training. Uh, Cause it is obviously a liability if, you know, the dog needs to learn not to like just walk in front of a car kind of thing. So that that's all done up in New York. And then the handlers actually go up to the school for about two weeks and train there uh, with their dogs. Okay. So how would that work for someone with um, diabetes? Cause I know that you can have a service animal for that. Yeah. Do you know? So diabetes, like diabetic alert dogs. Um, I don't know too much about them. I like looked into it because obviously I'm like, oh, it would be great to have a service dog um, until you see the price tag. And then you're like, oh, never mind, because it's like ten thousand dollars to get one that's trained. And then when you like do the math and everything, you're like ten thousand dollars life expectancy and working working life for a, a lab, uh, which a lot of them are labs, is about maybe seven to eight years by the time you get them. And for me, it's like not really realistic because I work in a vet industry. Um, it, I, I can't bring my dog to work into exam rooms with me. So yeah. like it would be cool to have, but I'm also like, it just doesn't fit my lifestyle. Um, yeah. But I know that diabetic alert dogs are trained using scent detection. So they actually smell low and high blood sugar. Um, so for people, I know some people have like really, really brittle diabetes where they have like really fast, rapid up and downs and Dexcoms might just not, and Dexcoms and CGMs might just not cut it for them. Whereas a diabetic alert dog, it, it's not relying on technology, it's relying on its scent. So if it's mm -hmm. trained well enough, theoretically, it should be able to detect low blood sugar, high blood sugar. Sometimes when you're dropping really fast, the dogs can pick up on that too. So mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting. I know nothing about training scent detection, but I know a lot of other medical alert dogs are trained the same way, but I know there's several organizations that train the dogs, but they're, I don't think any of them are not-for-profits. Like uh, a lot of the guide dog schools are, or I should say, provide the dogs free um, to handlers because most of them are not-for-profits. Uh, they're just much smaller scale, so they don't have the funds to be able to just um, like give donate. dogs for free, So, which is understandable. Yeah. Yeah. So more broadly speaking, is there anything that you would say you would want to make a change to in the diabetes sector? Just kind of our last closing question. Yeah, I think it would be education of people who aren't diabetic. It's such a common disease. Like it, it really is really, really, really common. You see people all the time, especially in the summer now that everyone has uh, short sleeve shirts on and shorts. You see the Omnipods, the Dexcoms, the Tandems. Yeah, I have my Dexcom. I think it's, no, it's on this arm. So <laughs> Um, I have the tandem on, on my hip. Sometimes you can't see it depending on the shirt I'm wearing, but it, it, mm -hmm. it exists. Um, it, it's so common. And I think a lot of, there's a lot of, I guess, misconceptions about it, especially, um, younger people, um, who are diagnosed younger that, um, with like type one people just don't understand what that is. I've had people say really weird things to me. One time I was in a pharmacy just trying to get my flu shot and, uh, this guy, he was, he was saying he was a physician. And then he was saying that the Dexcom doesn't actually work and that it's not accurate. And I'm like, okay, thank you for your opinion. When you're my doctor, I'll like ask you kind of thing. Yeah. And he was an older, um, he was an older man. So I, I was obviously respectful, just like I would beat any other person, but I kind of had to do like the whole, like, please stop talking to me, you know, kind of like, I understand what you're saying. Um, I had a friend, a classmate in, in college who told me that, um, God would cure my diabetes, which was an interesting one, which I couldn't really fight back with her about. Cause I'm like, you know what, it's your religion. It's what you believe in. Um, yeah. I was also kind of like, uh, it's been three years. So, um, and it's just kind of stuff like trying to get people to understand that like, it's not curable. You can't just go and eat a ton of cinnamon or whatever that is they tell you to do. Yeah. Um, it's not going to get cured. Um, even eating low carb is not going to cure it. I know type two diabetics, some of them, not even all of them, uh, yeah. can eat low carb and make lifestyle changes. That's the other thing that I tell people because they're like, oh, type two diabetes is curable and it's always lifestyle. I'm like, no, it's genetic too. Some yeah. people, they don't control it. Like it's, it's not just like really bad. And, and especially since like when I'm at diabetes link events, I'm always like mindful of that because we're not just type one people. Yeah. So I don't want to go and paint all of the type two diabetics as being these 
people who have poor lifestyle choices because it's it's not like that well like um, just more stigma like I think ultimately a lot of people not because I think like people might not necessarily understand the exact science behind and like treatment of people with like other chronic illnesses or like cancer mm-hmm. or things like that but I think because diabetes got such um like fat phobic stigma from the beginning yeah. mm-hmm. I think it's been really hard to undo that messaging for all types of diabetes and now that there's so many types it can I know. be really <laughs> but you're just yeah. like you're like, no, this is literally just a medical condition. Like it has nothing to do. Like you just wouldn't ever, like you would never even look at a smoker and be like, well, this is why you have lung cancer. You're like, oh, you have lung cancer. that's horrible. Like, yeah. I'm so sorry. The not like, is, yeah, not you like, know, oh, you should, like, oh, you should eat some cinnamon. Go, go work out more. Yeah. Like, it's, it's just like, not. I'm like working out sometimes actually raises my blood sugar. So yes. how do you, how do you, how do you lower how do you blood sugar? sugar? <laughs> But exactly. I think also what people also say things like make comments about like, oh, you you're too young to have diabetes or, oh, you're too thin to have diabetes. I'm like, yes. there are type two diabetics who are not overweight. There are type one diabetics that may be overweight. There's yeah. also type one diabetics that are underweight. Uh, like it's, yes. it's, I know, or like people who are like, oh, well, um, I'm not a kid, so I can't have that. And I'm like, uh, that's what I thought too. And then I was, cause I had a friend in, in elementary school who was diabetic. He was type one diabetic. And I was like, oh, like he seemed to manage his condition. Well, I don't really know. Um, but he, um, like, I was like, oh, that seems like it would be something really scary. Cause you know, when you're kids and you're like, oh my gosh, you have to take shots. That's scary. Shots are, those are not good. I could never do that. I love when people tell me I could never give myself a shot. And I'm yeah. like, oh, yes, well, you, you would. Can. <laughs> or yeah. when people are like, I could never give you a glucagon emergency injection. I'm like, okay, then when I die, you can tell my family that kind of thing. Yeah. So, um, it's just true. like, yeah, you can do anything if you're put in the right situation, the right scenario. But um, yeah. yeah, I think, I think people just need to be open-minded with any sort of disability. Now you like, it, it would be unfair to say um, like, even like mental health issues, like, oh, you have depression, then you obviously don't leave your house and you never take showers. Like that's also an unfair um like something. Yeah. and it you can't, doesn't apply to most people so yeah. um it's unfair to say oh all diabetics are overweight and don't eat well and don't exercise it's like no and I think now more people understand what type 1 diabetes is because it is more common but when I try to explain to people I'm like it's autoimmune it's it, my body just killed part of me um and then I think then they know because I'll be like oh well you know lupus or Crohn's and I'll start naming out and they're like oh yeah I know someone with MS I'm like yeah it's like that except now my pancreas instead of my neurons or something like that so yeah exactly definitely a lot to educate people on I definitely agree I think everything's is falls back to education in the end and it'd be nice if like if in like health classes, it could in diabetes. So to tell people, these are the symptoms of diabetes too. Cause it's yes. hard. It's like, I kind of knew the symptoms of diabetes and that like, I probably learned about in school, but like, you know, like I'm not a medical student. I don't go through and memorize all this stuff, but like for, especially I think like pediatricians, like my pediatrician totally over uh, looked a, a little bit of what happened to me and writing it off as like, Oh, you grew a little bit. So that's why you're, you lost weight. Um, whereas like, especially you just hear really terrible stories even now about kids who go in having problems and their parents like I don't know what's wrong with them and they go to the ER and they're like oh it's a respiratory infection prescribe them steroids and then the kids end up getting really sick or dying because they actually had diabetes and it's so easy just to do a blood sugar test it's not even you don't even have to run a whole panel it's just um it's not the first thing that comes to mind because technically not it's not a common disease type one but that's the thing that's hard. Yeah. It's like how to figure out how to do like widespread testing to the general population in a way that's affordable and also <laughs> actually reaching every single person. Like it's mm-hmm. very, very hard. And there yeah. are companies that are trying to do that because they've figured out mm-hmm. ways that you can screen for diabetes before it's actually like properly developed into needing insulin. Cause there yeah. are like, I think essentially there are either three or five phases, but people don't usually get diagnosed until the third phase. But yeah. you can tell that you like have it or are beginning to develop it at stage one. So mm-hmm. if they started that, people wouldn't even need insulin. They would just need to take like a medication. Well, they so have a definitely- medication now for to prevent the diet, which is yeah. what I think is crazy. And my siblings are technically high risk now because I was diagnosed. I'm like, go get tested. It's like a, it's a finger prick. I I, th- I think some are finger pricks, some are blood tests. And there, there's other reasons why they chose not to do that. But I'm like, man, if I had that option, which for me, yeah. been like. You would have known so years ago. I would have been like on it for like eight years, eight, 10 years. Like that's even if it was like a year, I'd be like, I'll take it. Cause it's just so nice. 
it, it's yeah. not even less. Like you're also adding on because the longer you have it, the more likely you are to have complications, even if it is well managed and well controlled. So like giving yourself, obviously, like I'm sure there's some statistic out there that someone did the math and was like, each year of diabetes lessens your life expectancy by this number of months or something. Well, then by extending one year, not being clinically diagnosed, you're adding on an extra how many months to your life expectancy. So, um, but I mean, there's a lot of reasons some people might, might choose not to get tested. So. I don't understand that. I'd be like, I don't want it. So definitely holistically more education. And I think it would be a lot less scary for sure. Yeah. Um, also just for parents and like, if your kid's ever just like dropping weight really fast mm-hmm. and for doctors too, like if you ever have a, a patient come in and, and they're just dropping weight fast, um, cause sometimes it does happen like in two weeks, especially for younger kids, just, just give them a blood sugar test. And then if it's normal, it's fine. And that's great. But if it's so, it's like diabetes is so easy to diagnose, but it's also so easy to overlook. So, um, especially in younger kids. Yes. Yes. When they can't describe their symptoms. Yeah. It's just parents being like, well, they're going to the bathroom. Especially kids in diapers are like, well, they always go to the bathroom and their diapers. So it's like, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Definitely hard. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you so much for meeting with me today. Yeah. Thank you so much for letting me talk. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. It's been great hearing more about your story and more about veterinary science. I definitely like it's exciting to hear just everything that people with diabetes are doing because I'm just like, we can do it all. It's just like weird and hard, but we can do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I'll let you know what we end up doing with this because I don't think we're going to post it directly on Instagram as it is, but we'll like cut it and figure out what to do. So, okay. Sounds good. Awesome. Have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you. You too. Bye. Bye.